Good morning, everyone. Welcome this morning to Lake Oconee Presbyterian Church. My name is Jeff Birch, and I'm the pastor here at Lake Oconee, and it is my pleasure and privilege to be able to welcome all of you this morning as we gather to worship and glorify the Lord in spirit and in truth. And we offer that welcome, whether you are here with us in person or if you're joining us on the live stream through our feed on Facebook or YouTube, we are thrilled you've chosen to worship with us. And we want to invite you to like us, check in, make yourself known. We look for ways to incorporate you. I know it's virtual, it's not the same thing, but any way that we can incorporate you into the fold and into the community, we would love to have the opportunity to do that. If you're visiting with us here in person for the first time this morning, a couple of things. One, we are thrilled you've chosen to worship with us. We hope it's a rich experience and you received a warm welcome. And part of that warm welcome is the bag of swag that we offer to all of you. And so we would love for you to grab a bag out there or a deacon probably brought it to you. And there's some goodies in there like tumblers and different things like that. We would love to just be able to ha- for you to have that as our gift. For everyone, on the end of the row, you'll find friendship pads. And this is whether you're visiting or a longtime member. We would love uh, to get to know you and to develop a friendship with you. So sign in that pad if you would, pass it down the row, and then we will collect them at the end. I want to share, this is a very, very special announcement I want to make. Charter member of LOPC, Elise Edmonds, turns 100. Now get this in the providence of God, today. She was born October 17th, 1921. I think we ought to give her a huge LOPC happy birthday to Elise. What do you think? I'm not even sure I can count to 100. (laughs) Evie and I had the privilege of being over at her house on Friday, and we were asking her to share some of her stories. They are absolutely amazing. She's telling us things, I mean, talk about sharp. She was telling us things that she remembered from her childhood that were just utterly incredible to hear. And so... Praise the Lord for his faithfulness in Elise's life and that she is a part of our community. Now, speaking of being a part of our community, we have an inquirer's class coming up. The dates are November 12th and 13th. The format is we do it on a Friday night from 6 to 9 o'clock, and then we meet again on a Saturday, and we start at 9, and we'll end more than likely before 3 o'clock. If we're real fast, we'll end sooner. And uh, if you are interested in that, there are many ways to sign up. There's a sign-up sheet on the display table. You can go online to our website and sign up. I even think there's an insert today that you could fill up and sign up. So there's many ways to do that. Uh, We ask that if you're going to join this church, we want you to take this class. But taking the class does not obligate you to joining the church. In other words, you could take it and kind of check things out and get a feel for it things. It doesn't obligate you to anything. There are many other announcements that are in your bulletin. I would encourage you after the service this afternoon, however you want, but to read them then, to peruse that. But now as the uh, prelude is played for us, let's prepare our hearts to come into the very presence of God.
Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 147. Friends, let's remember that it is the Lord who initiates and it is the Lord who calls us to worship Him. What an incredible privilege it is to commune with the living God. Friends, hear God's call to us, His invitation to us to come into His presence and to worship Him. Psalm 147, praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Lord, we invoke your presence, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we, your children, the outcasts, would come together to praise you who is abundant in power, who heals the brokenhearted, who binds up our wounds, who determines the numbers of the stars and gives to all of them their names. You are glorious and sovereign, and we rejoice in who you are, in Jesus Christ, our name, his name, amen. Would you please stand as we sing together, crown him with many crowns. This morning, we are going to take a look at a reading of God's Word from the Old Testament. As we've been going through the book of Romans, one of the things I've shared with you is that Romans chapter 4 is basically an exposition of the life of Abraham and specifically of the covenant that God made with Abraham. And so throughout Romans chapter 4, there are allusions to both Genesis chapter 15 
and the passage that I will be reading this morning, Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 8, where verse 5 is specifically quoted in the passage in Romans 4 we're looking at, or we will be looking at in a few minutes. And so friends, hear the word of the Lord, Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face. And God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Let's stand and continue to praise the Lord, singing together, Christ will be my hideaway.
You may be seated. That is such a beautiful song. And Elise's favorite scripture verse happens to be Psalm 46. And Psalm 46 says, think about this, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, I will not fear. How is that psalm fulfilled? How can we look at that psalm and say yes and amen to that psalm? Because Christ came and fulfilled it. He's the fulfiller of that promise. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And so in Christ, he will be our hideaway. He's our shelter and our banner and our refuge. And he has invited us to come before him and to pour out our hearts. We will together as a family pray the prayer he taught us to pray, the Lord's Prayer. And then uh, allow me, I will lead us in prayer for a few moments. So friends... Let us pour out our hearts to our hideaway. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, we praise you, for you are great in power and yet tender in care. You don't call us or require us to come up to you, but you became our hideaway in sending Jesus to come down to us. Father, we give you praise, and we take shelter in you. While the storms may be going on all around us. Lord, may our trust ever be in you. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness in Elisa's life, and we pray, Lord, for your continued presence with her. We thank you for her. Thank you that she's part of our family, and we give you praise for your grace and your kindness and your mercy to her and your mercy to us in having us be a family. Father, we pray for your kingdom to come and your will to be done. We pray, Father, as we move forward in ministry, as we have a new members class soon, as we have grief share events, as we have Bible studies and home fellowships going on, as men gather together, and women gather together, as the deacons meet and as the session meets, and a whole lot of planning is going on. Father, we need to not... Your word says that we are to walk with the Spirit. And I'm mindful of the dangers that we can get ahead of the Spirit, we can go too fast, or we could lag behind and fall behind the Spirit. So I pray that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us, how He's leading, that we would be dependent upon you. Show us the way and guide us that we wouldn't go our own way. We would, as the Wisdom literature says that we would trust in you with all our hearts, leaning not on our own understanding of things, that in all our ways we would acknowledge you and we'd rest in the promise that you make straight our paths, that we would be not wise in our own eyes. What a temptation that is. As we pray, lead us not into temptation. Oh, it is so tempting for us to be wise in our own eyes to do what we think makes sense to us, to live by our common sense. And it may be great sense, but it may not be your will. So we pray to be not wise in our own eyes, to fear you, to turn away from evil. And Father, we thank you for your provision for us, your love for us, and we acknowledge that yours is the kingdom, yours is the power. Yours is the glory. May our eyes ever be fixed upon you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
I love that song that Barb and Elizabeth sang. Your love compels me is actually a quote of 2 Corinthians 5.14, which is one of my favorite verses in all of the scripture that talks about the love of Christ controlling us. And it actually, I think, elaborates or explains a big part of why I do what I do. My vision is that the love of Christ would so control us that we couldn't help for it to overflow into our lives of radical worship of God, where we are just giving our hearts and our lives to God because of His love. We're loving one another, again, because of His love for us. We're loving each other, and we want His love to be on display and manifest to the world around us, that we want Lake Oconee, we want this area to see and to encounter and to come face to face with the love of God through His people. So thank you for singing that and reminding us because every week when we go to the Word, from the whole counsel of God, Old Testament, New Testament, we're going to be seeing how the love of Christ is to compel us. The love of Christ is to control us from many, many different angles. This morning we're continuing, we're going to be looking at for a couple of more weeks, Romans chapter 4, then we'll be doing something a little different for a couple of months, then we'll get back to Romans, so a little bit, so we will get to the whole counsel of God as we do this. This morning we're looking at Romans chapter 4, verses 13 to 17, and I ask that you join me as we pray together. Father, may your spirit open the eyes of our hearts, that our, the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, that you would open them, that we may know the hope to which you have called us, the glorious inheritance that we share together with the saints, and the immeasurable glory of your power that is at work within us, power that you describe as and liken to the same power that's at work in us that raised Jesus from the dead. So may we see the beauty of the gospel this morning. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, hear the word of the Lord. Romans chapter 4, verses 13 to 17 says, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring. Now, we've been talking about we're his offspring. So this promise is not just to Abraham, it's and to us. That he would be, and catch this, we're going to go over this, would be heir of the world. Quite the inheritance, isn't it? It did not come through the law, but it came through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith. In order that the, promised, the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring not only to the adherents of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. I want to ask you a question. How big is your God? Now, I know what we say up here, but for most of us, our God is way too small. I need to tell you a story. My favorite book outside the Bible, Bible's number one, but my favorite non-Bible book is actually a novel by a man by the name of J.R.R. Tolkien. It's called The Lord of the Rings. I'm not sure if I've given you a Lord of the Rings illustration yet, but I'm sure over time this will be the first of many. Now, let me tell you, the main character in the story is a young hobbit, and his name is Frodo. Now, Frodo had an uncle, and his uncle was named Bilbo. So you get that? We've got Frodo and Uncle Bilbo. Now, Frodo was preparing to make a quest, a journey, and Bilbo gave him what's called a coat of mail for the journey. Not mail like the U.S. mail, by the way, to form, but it was little rings of metal that were forged together, interlocking to form a coat, a heavy coat that you would wear 
underneath your regular coat. The coat was made of something they would call mithril, and a mithril coat of mail, as it was called, was armor. So if something tried to hit you, it couldn't cut through. So Frodo received this from Bobo, from Bilbo, excuse me. Allergies are still getting to me, by the way, if you haven't. I feel great, but I'm still, <clears throat> my voice is still giving me a hard time. So Frodo received this from Bilbo and put it on and hid it underneath his old coat. Now one day, Frodo overheard a conversation between two of his other companions on their journey. And these two other companions were talking about Bilbo. And one said to the other, they had this conversation, he says, you know, Bilbo was quite really a rich man, very wealthy. But above all his riches, above all his wealth, he had one possession that outstripped them all, worth more than everything else he owned. Many years ago, he was given a mithril coat. See, mithril was the most valuable and precious metal, more valuable than gold or silver. It was stronger and lighter at the same time, more beautiful when the light struck it. And the other companion looked at the first companion, astonished, and said, wait, an entire coat of mithril? Do you know what that is worth? That one coat of mail is worth more than all the property in the entire country. And Frodo suddenly reached and felt underneath his old coat and staggers with the knowledge that he is wearing something that is worth more than his entire country. Do you know what you have in the gospel? Just to give you one other verse, Colossians chapter 2 Verse 3 says, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Not some, not a little, not a few. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. And if you are a Christian, do you know what makes you a Christian? It's not that you walked an aisle one day. It's not that you accepted Jesus as your Savior. It is that you are united you are one with this Christ. He lives in you, as it were. By faith, we are united to Christ. Like wearing a coat of mithril mail underneath your clothing, everything of Christ is credited and given to you. That's the bigness of the gospel that Paul has been trying to convey to the Romans. Again, I'm going to ask you, how big is your God? Christian, do you understand what you have in being united to Jesus Christ? See, let's review for a second and look at what we've been doing as we've been going through these early chapters of Paul's letter to the Romans. He's laying out for the Christians in Rome the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the way, why I pr prayed the way I prayed. That we would see the beauty of the gospel. That the eyes of our heart would be enlightened to see the bigness of the gospel. He's preparing to visit them, to take his missionary endeavors westward, hoping to go to Spain, and he's recruiting support from the Roman church. So he wants them to know, this is what I'm all about. He's holding up before the Roman Christians the truth, the beauty, the wonder of the gospel, along with its comprehensive scope and the implications which flow out of the gospel. And here in Romans 4, He's emphasizing how the promise of the gospel is to be embraced and received through faith. We receive all the benefits of the gospel through faith in Jesus Christ, which unites us to Christ, and Christ pours out his benefits to us. That's why verse 13 says, the promise comes not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And in the passage before us this morning, Paul is giving a word of exhortation, a word of instruction concerning how the promise of salvation is to be received by faith, and he does so by showing us the bigness of God. He wants you to know how big your God is. Paul had a way of putting in summary form what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to be a disciple. It's found in 1 Corinthians 13. He said, this is what spiritual formation looks like. He said, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three but the greatest of these is love. See, our God is too small. We are settling 
for far too less in our spiritual formation and our living out of the gospel. So in this passage, Paul is going to show us three things, all related to faith, hope, and love. Yes, I'm getting back to a three-point sermon, by the way. Getting back to my roots in Presbyterian preaching. Three things he shows us, first of all, faith that rests on true grace, hope that is built on an enormous promise, and love for a diverse family. So I want you to think about how can we cultivate faith, hope, and love in our life. Faith resting on true grace. Let's explore Paul's flow of thought here in these verses. He begins in verse 13. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Did you catch that? It depends on faith that it may rest on grace. Faith that rests on the gift of God. Not our performance, not our merit, not anything we warrant or deserve. Now, verse 13 begins with a little word, but it's a very important word. The word for means it's connecting what Paul is talking about now, this paragraph, with what preceded in the previous paragraph, and that is that the promise is appropriated by means not of the law, but by faith. The references to the law points back to the earlier discussion of circumcision, which since it was required for entrance into the covenant by Jews, might seem logical for them to require it for Gentiles seeking entrance into the church. In other words, in that congregation, the practical issue is, is it a requirement for a Gentile convert that he or she must become effectively Jewish? In other words, adopt Jewish cultural practice in order to be welcomed and accepted. And Paul's answer is an unequivocal no. He's saying that this is an absolute contradiction of the gospel. He is once again emphasizing his polemic against work, against works, the incompatibility of faith and works as a system. He's not saying works is bad, but he's saying if you use works, if you use performance, if you use how you're doing as a Christian, as a basic system of does God like me? Am I accepted by God? Will God bless me? He says faith becomes irrelevant. Grace becomes irrelevant. The faith becomes null and void. Now I know what we're all saying. We're going, we don't do this. Jeff, what are you talking about? We never do this. Well, let me apply this to us for a second. A couple different ways that um, I beg to differ. I do it. And I would bet you do it as well. See, what are some ways that we, even subtly, that we may not be aware of, depend on our own moral performance, our own how are we doing the law, instead of relying functionally on Christ by faith? See, for example, let's take something. Have you ever heard in the Christian life that thing called a quiet time? Time in God's Word, our morning devotion, spending time in God's Word. Now, am I saying reading the Bible is bad? Am I I telling my flock, don't read the Bible? (gasps) Horrors! Of course not! But how many of us, how many of us subtly say to ourselves or feel this tug of guilt or shame or anxiety or a little pull? Ooh, I missed my time in the Word. Will, Will my day be good? Will I have a good day? Am I still blessed by God? What are we depending on for God's blessing? Our quiet time or Christ? Our time in God's Word or Christ? Or here, I'll, I'll, I'll really tell you, I've been here almost six months now. I'm feeling a little bit more secure. Let me, let me step on, let me, let me talk to the, the elders and deacons here are going to, uh, you know, relax. This is okay for a second. This example, second example. What about tithing? They're all going, Dick Forrester's going, oh no, don't. 
Tithing is good, okay? Let me make sure we all know that. We got that? It's on tape. It's out there for the internet to know. Jeff is saying tithing's fine. But how many of us think, okay, I tithed. I'll be blessed financially. God will bless my finances because I tithe. Let me ask us a question. Who are you doing it for? Who are you giving your money for? Are you giving it for the glory of God and the advancement of His kingdom? Or are you giving it so that you will be blessed financially? There are subtle ways we live by performance and how we're doing rather than by Christ. And listen to what the text says. Because it says, for the law brings wrath. But where there's no law, there is no transgression. See, he's answering the question as to why the inheritance cannot be realized by observing the law. In other words, the blessing can't come through the law. That's why I've been saying we are except Christianity is so unique in that Christianity is the only faith, the only religion that says you don't work for your acceptance, you work out of your acceptance. You were accepted, and out of that, you love and obey God. You don't work for God's love. See, Paul's answer here is the law provides wrath. One commentator put it this way. He says, the main problem with the law, it seems, is that its function, its purpose, is to show up sin and deal with it. And there is quite a lot of sin to show up and deal with, not least within the covenant people themselves. Thus, if the law were to be a defining characteristic of God's people, God would quite simply not have a people at all. If there is to be a renewed people of God, a covenant family, there must be, in that sense, a law-free zone for them to live and flourish within. Otherwise, faith would be useless, and the promise God made to him would, in effect, be abolished. One last thing before I move on to the next point. What does Paul mean when he says where there is no law, there is no transgression? That can seem a little confusing. What does Paul mean by that? Most commentators agree that Paul here is making a distinction between transgression and sin. There's two different words for that. So Paul is not saying that there's no sin apart from the Mosaic law. In fact, in the very next chapter, Paul will write in Romans 5, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But here he's looking at the fact that there is no, where there is no transgression, where there's no law, excuse me, there is no transgression. So again, quoting another commentator, he said, we should not conclude that wrath is experienced only when a written commandment is violated, but transgression is defined as the violation of a revealed command which means that the Jews who had the revealed written law had even greater responsibility for their sin and as great a need to be saved from God's wrath and justified by faith. See, what is Paul saying to both Jews and Gentiles at the Church of Rome? There is one way to salvation, one way to justification, one way to the blessing of God, and it's through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the first point. Second, hope built on an enormous promise. Look back with me at verse 13. And this is incredible. I went quickly over it the first time because I knew I'd be coming back to it now. He says, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world. Pause there for a second. Do you see the breadth of this promise? Again, Reading one writer, he said, the promise to Abraham and his family. So this is us. We are the offspring of Abraham. This promise to Abraham and his family, Paul says, was that he would inherit the world. That he would be heir of the world. He says, this is breathtaking. Again and again in Genesis, the writer declares that God promised Abraham a small piece of territory, then known as the land of Canaan, roughly the holy land as we know it now. For Paul, however, and indeed the whole New Testament, 
the idea of a holy land in terms of one strip of territory over against all the others has simply vanished. It doesn't exist. It's gone away. In its place are the beginnings of a completely transformed idea of land that the whole world, and when we get to Romans 8, he will say the entire creation is claimed by God as holy land and is promised to Abraham and his family as inheritance. So when Paul is explaining how Abraham's family has been transformed into a multi-ethnic entity, he should also insist that God's real intention, his plan A in promising Abraham the land of Canaan was to claim, rule, and renew the whole world. Do you hear that? God's mission, our future, and our present hope is the renewal of the entire cosmos, the renewal of the entire creation. This writer says the Holy Land was, it seems, a kind of advanced metaphor. It was pointing ahead to something far more spectacular, far greater in scope, a bigger, larger aim and promise. Do we understand this promise? See, this is what Jesus meant in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Do you want to know what your hope and your future is? It's God's new world, which will be physical. We will inherit the entire earth. All of this. Can you imagine seeing the Grand Canyon renewed? And you know how I love golf. Come on, you golf fans. Can you, do you realize Augusta National has fallen right now, that we haven't seen a renewed Augusta National? A renewed Pebble Beach? And friends, I say all this, but this is true. Did you catch the words, Abraham and his offspring? Look again at the text if you have to. I'm not lying. This is the truth. Our heirs of the whole world. Do you recognize the hope that we have? This is the promise of final salvation, of consummation. This is the promise we pray each and every Lord's Day when we call out to God, Thy kingdom come. That does not mean floating around on clouds. That means we're heirs of the whole world, a new heavens and a new earth, of the world finally put to rights. No more pain, no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more injustice. The world will be finally put to rights. And this is our final inheritance and hope. This is why we can say God is our refuge and strength an ever-present help in trouble, because we know what awaits us. So how does this impact us? How does this change us? I've listened to so many Tim Keller sermons over the year, I have no idea which sermon this would be, but Tim Keller somewhere says, the way you handle your present is completely determined by what you believe your future to be. Listen to that. He says, your prospects. He says, here's what a hope is. A future prospect, something so great and so good that it makes it possible to face the hardship, face the difficulties. It makes it possible to face the hardship without denial, without suppressing it, and to know that everything you do is meaningful and not pointless. Which is why suffering is one of the primary ways today that we bear witness to the glory of God. When we suffer and we handle our suffer, Suffering, not by pretending it's not there, not by pretending it's not real, not by minimizing or denying, by embracing it, but say our sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory, and this is the glory that will be revealed in us, that we, the meek, will inherit the earth. All of this is yours as the family of God. Amazing. Are the eyes of our hearts, do we have ears to hear and eyes to see the wonder? How big is your God? Faith and hope. Lastly, love for a diverse family. See, this is what discipleship is, by the way. Discipleship is learning to cultivate these. These three remain, Paul said, faith, hope, and love. 
And the greatest of these is love. And the greatest of these is love because it is founded on faith and fueled by hope. And the fruit is love. Hey, there's a three-point sermon of all Fs there. I didn't even realize that. That wasn't in my notes, by the way. Founded, fueled, and fruit. I'll have to preach that sometime. But look with me at verses 16 and 17. He says, that is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, that's us, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham. Listen to this next part. Who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. God's mission, he's renewing all of creation. He's renewing the whole world, and he's creating to be the stewards of that world a people, a beautiful community, a beautiful multi-ethnic family, a covenant people, one people of God. See, this is why we need to cultivate faith, realizing that the promise rests on grace, not our moral or spiritual performance. We need to cultivate hope, Hope in this enormous promise of an incredibly bright future where our inheritance is to be heirs of the world. That is why our lives matter now in everything that we're doing. And lastly, we're cultivating a life of love, particularly for our diverse, multi-ethnic family of the children of Abraham. Verse 16 says, Abraham is the father of all. And he quotes Genesis 17, verse 5, where he says, God has made him the father of many nations. See, who was the God that Abraham believed in? It says, in the presence of God, verse 17, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. This God that Abraham believed in is the God who gives life to the dead. That is, all of us who were dead in our trespasses and sins and calls into existence a people from all nations the things that do not exist. That's why I included in your reflection for this morning a quote from Scott Sauls who says, Jesus did not come to make bad people good. Listen carefully to this. Jesus did not come to make bad people good or good people better, but to bring dead people to life. Father of many nations means that God's family is a huge family. It's a very big family, and it's a very diverse family. And spiritual formation, discipleship, I'm convinced, is so much more a matter of who we are in our lives, our being, and not just our doing. Is doing important? Yes, it is. But doing flows out of being. Our doing is important, but it must flow flow out of the kind of people We are called to be people of faith, people of hope, and people of love. See, let me ask you this question. What kind of Christian do you want to be? What kind of Christian do you think God is calling us to be? What kind of church is he calling us to be? What kind of impact do we want to make? See, I'm convinced in just our being, not in our ordinary lives, don't Hear me saying we have to be something special and extraordinary. That's not what God's calling us. He's saying in your ordinary lives, being a people of faith, hope, and love, united to Christ, this way better than mithril mail underneath our coat when we're united to Christ. We make more of an impact than we could ever imagine. This is a lengthy quote, so forgive me for that but it's a good quote. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Weight of Glory, talks about how we make more of an impact than we're ever aware of. He writes, it is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are, in some degree, helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities. It is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them 
that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as a life of a gnat. But it is immortal, immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. Friends, we are to treat everyone with dignity. The dignity of being an image bearer of God. We make more of an impact than we are aware of. I'm reminded of that in my own life when I think about the man who introduced me to Jesus, a man by the name of Bob McCook. And he was the, inst the human instrument that God used. God does the saving, but he uses us to move us in one towards one destination or another. And he used Bob in my life to introduce me to Jesus and move me towards Christ. What did Bob do that God used to change my life? He loved me. Nothing extraordinary. He loved me. He offered me friendship. I saw him for the first time in 1979 in the hallways of Downingtown High School, walking around just hanging out. And he said hi to me. And then he introduced me to Jesus. He held out the gospel for me. There was no way at that point in my life that I was headed to being a Presbyterian pastor. I guarantee you that was not in any yearbook that they put out. Jeff is about to become a Presbyterian pastor. If you were to ask me then what I would do with my life, I probably would have told you, finish college, get a job in business, make lots of money, play golf, and hang out. That was what was on my radar. No way was being a Christian or a minister on my radar. And what did Bob do? He said, hi. He befriended me. He loved me. He treated me with dignity. He didn't abandon me. He loved me enough to introduce me to Jesus. He treated me with honor. You realize Peter in his first letter says that we are to honor everyone? Those we disagree with, those in our family, those we sit across the table with, those that we don't agree at all with, we are to honor them. See, do you believe God can use you? He can. Faith, hope, and love. Faith that rests on grace. Hope that is built on an incredible promise. Love for all the image bearers around us, for a diverse family. See, friends, I wish we would quit, and I'm speaking now to the whole the Christian church, I wish we would quit making the Christian life so difficult, trying to get everything right. I'm going to cross every T and dot every I, and I'm going to be perfect and so precise. No, we're not. We can't. We see in a mirror dimly. I wish we would trust God and cultivate in our lives and in our relationships faith, hope, and love and reveal the one, manifest the one, put on display the one that we're united to. When you leave here in a few minutes and go out into the world, if you're a Christian, Jesus Christ is with you. You're wearing that much greater than mithril male. You are wearing the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And all we do is make him known. Let's pray. Father, I ask your forgiveness for making you too small in my life. And I pray for my own heart, my own life, and for the life of Lake Oconee, that we would, we serve a big God, may we functionally know how big a God you are. I pray that you will be big in our lives, not by us being extraordinary, but living ordinary lives of faith, hope, and love. 
Thank you for your word to all of us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, I invite us to stand and sing our closing hymn this morning. My hope is built on nothing less. now receive the Lord's benediction. May the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now, this week, and forevermore. Amen.